for meditation this morning. We're turning to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel uh, chapter 5. I've entitled today's sermon, Trusting the Evidence. Uh, Trusting the Evidence, because that's what doesn't happen in 1 Samuel Samuel chapter 5. That's our lesson. It's to do the opposite to what the Philistines teach us to do in 1 Samuel chapter 5. This week, uh, Sandra and I uh, nipped down to St. Helens to visit Sarah. Uh, We uh, borrowed a tent and we went camping for a few days. And uh, on Friday, uh, we had a bit of of an adventure. We decided to go to Formby for the day. I don't know if you've ever been to Formby. I don't know if you've ever tried to drive from St. Helens to Formby, but I thought it would be a relatively simple task. You know, given I'm 50 years old, I've driven for a few years, I know my way around, don't I? And all was going well until we came to this roundabout. And um, the sat navs was on. Sandra was there guiding me with her wisdom and, and knowledge of the road. I could read the signs. I could hear the instructions. I know what's going on, but not a sweat. Missed the turn off. Didn't know where I was going. Ended up going on a whole a miles long circuitous route. Missed another opportunity to go the right way. And ended up right back at the same roundabout I was at before. But this time I was sure everything was going to be all right because I've been there before. I made a mistake. I know where I went wrong. And Sandra was there. Satnav was there. The instructions were there. Um, but of course, I was, and I was on the right road for a, at least five seconds. I was in the right lane on the roundabout, and then uh, something happened, and I went back onto the same path as the last time, and then another route round, and back again, and number three, same roundabout, same direction, been through it twice, sat nav was on, Sandra was on. Don't know if Sandra was on. (laughs) I didn't listen to Sandra, that's what it was. That's it. Third time, wrong road. Right back on the thing. Thankfully, this time, I managed to catch the second thing. And it was, <laughs> Sandra pointed it out to me. All right, I'll give, her that. I'll give her credit for that. But I couldn't believe it. Here I was, and I know I have a reasonable understanding how to drive. I know I haven't driven as far as Robert has, you know, but I have, a rough, I have a rough idea what's going on. But could I work out what was going on? Not a sweat. And, it, and I, was, I was thinking about it after. I was thinking about the... It was, it was the numbers that confused me because there was an M48 and an A49 and they seemed to be going the same direction but they were actually different directions and I wasn't... And my sat nav was saying one thing... Oh, well, that's what I'm blaming. I'm blaming everything else apart from me. My, my, my cognizance was perfect. But it was all confusion. But as I thought about this, I th- I th- this, this speaks to me about one of my problems when I'm down. I don't trust that enough. I always think I know better. I always think I can see the, the way and I, ne- I never can fully commit to trusting it. Despite all the evidence I want to trust myself, and it always goes wrong. It always goes wrong. And it seems to me that's what happens here in this passage. The Philistines are trusting themselves. They're trusting about what they think. They're trusting about what they have accomplished. And they refuse to trust God. Now, we've already seen that in the previous chapter. We saw how Israel didn't trust God, even though Samuel's word was well known in the land. And the people of Israel could have went to Samuel and found out the right direction to go. And the Philistines could have done the same. There's previous uh, uh, encounters where foreign nations have gone to the prophets of God to find out the way, you know. But, but they didn't do it. And at the beginning of chapter 5, they find themselves in a really strange place for them. Because whenever, uh, in, in the previous chapter, whenever they heard that the, the Lord of the Israelites had come into the camp, they knew they were going to be defeated. They knew Dagon, their God, wasn't good enough to win the battle. But suddenly the Philistines find themselves on the victory side. They weren't expecting it. They thought they were going to be defeated. And they have this ark. They have this golden box and all beautiful and wonderful. And it's theirs now. 
and they're having to work out what to do with it. And that's where their problems just begin. They thought they had won the victory, but this is where trouble was coming. And I want to read uh, the first five verses of First Samuel chapter 5 to you just now. It says this, When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and they put him, up back, put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off from the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. Here were a people, and they have found themselves in possession of the ark of God. And here in these verses, you describe the, the, the outcome of their having the ark of God. And there's all the evidence that they can see. There is all the evidence that they know that their religion is powerless before the God of Israel. But do you notice something? They don't listen. They don't listen. Everything is saying your religion is powerless, but they won't listen. Think about it. They bring this, the, the, the ark of God, they bring this sacred object into their God's temple. And they set it before their idol. And you can imagine them celebrating this. This is a great day. They've defeated their enemies. They've won the victory. And their, their God, even though they thought he was going to be defeated, suddenly he has given them victory. And you can imagine them standing in the temple, celebrating in the temple, rejoicing in the temple, because here they have the evidence before them. But then they all have to go home. You can imagine the last guy out switching off the lights going, well, this has been a good day. Victory's been assured. Our God has won. We've defeated Yahweh. But when he comes back the next morning, when he flicks on the lights, there's a problem. There's evidence that something has happened. And it's not the Israelites. The Israelites are away licking their wounds. The Israelites have been defeated. But Dagon has fallen on his face before the ark of God. This is an important moment. This is a moment where the God of the Israelites is saying something to the people of the Philistines. He's telling them that what they knew in the beginning was right, that their God cannot hope to defeat the God of Israel. Their imaginary God cannot, um, can't even deign to stand before the true God of heaven and earth. But the, but the followers of Dagon are not perturbed. What do they do? Well, they do what religious folk do. They set their idol back up on its feet. They got him back up again, got everything ship ship so every, nobody would notice too much about it. You know, there's a, it's maybe just a one-off. It's just a surprise. It's just, it's just something that's happened, but it'll not happen again. And there's maybe, maybe more celebrations, maybe more rejoicing, maybe more sacrifices. But when they switch the light off uh, that night, then everything looking good. But the next day, light comes on. And Dagon is on the floor again before the ark. Not only that, but his head is removed and his hands are removed. He's, he's, he's stripped of all the vestiges of power that he has, even though he's an idol and he has no power. All, his, all the, the, the symbolism of his power is gone. And he's on his face before the ark of God. But do you notice what happened? They get them back up again, and all they do is change the way they worship. All they do is make a little alteration. It says, from that time forth, the priests of Dagon didn't enter or didn't step on the threshold of it. You know, here are these people, and, they're, and God is speaking to them in this really dramatic and exciting way, this really unexpected way, in that their idol is not able to stand before the 
the, the symbol of the presence of Yahweh, and all they can do is think to prop it up and pretend that everything's okay, pretend that all is going to be okay. Friends, to me, this is something that our world needs to hear about. This is something that you and I need to hear because this is what we do, isn't it? It's like me. I went the same way, three ways around that roundabout. I didn't change one iota hardly. And wondered why I ended up still being lost. And, well, we didn't eventually make it to Formby, but it took a long time to get there. And you see, that's the problem in our world. Our world thinks that they have a way to approach, they have ways to understand and approach God, that they have answers to great big questions about, uh, uh, about the nature of reality, about the nature of divinity. But all the evidence ranges around us, all the evidence ranges around this world, that our understanding is not big enough to understand God. Our means to approach God are not good enough. He won't let us go near Him because we're doing it the wrong way. That our answers to God's questions are not good enough. But when, we're, when we see this, when we hear what God says in His Word, when we see what God does in our world, what do we do? Instead of actually listening to what He says, no, we just prop up our idols. We prop up our own gods and hope that it'll, that it'll all work out in the end. Friends, how many people do we know? How many of these type of people were we at one time? Maybe you were a religious person before you were saved. And whenever God challenged you about what you were doing, how you thought you could work your way to please Him, how going to church would make Him feel differently about you, how, how saying your prayers would make God feel differently about your sin, but instead of actually trying to understand what He was saying to you, you just kept on going to church, you kept on saying your prayers, you kept on saying that you, that you believed when you didn't. Maybe you're an atheist, or maybe you know atheist friends. And God tells them in nature and in the gospel that I have made this stuff for you. I am there. And they say, no, it's only chance. It's all accident. Accidents make everything. Accidents can take nothing and make wonderful things out of it. And when they're confronted by what God says, all they, all they do is prop up their idea. Well, chance will do it. Throw a dice and it'll make it all Okay. Friends, we live in a world and that's what we do. We, we, we see God for who He is and we can see God because God hasn't left us unknowing. We go back to Romans chapter 1, 2 and 3 and 4 and what do we find there? God is speaking. God is speaking to our world. God is speaking to people. And in our world and in the Bible and in the church and in the gospel, and in Christ supremely, God is speaking to every man, woman, and child. He tells us about the unmade God who made all things through the power of His Word. He tells us about the triune God, the, one who go, the God who has always been a God of relationship and love, and who invites us into that relationship with Him. The good God who hates sin and only does what is right. The self-revealing God who refuses to be kept in the shadows, but shows Himself. The omniscient God who knows the end from the beginning, who knows what we're going through and knows the end of it and is with us. The saving God who came to die for us, to pay the penalty for our sins and bring us into a relationship with Him. The death-defeating God who said that death will not reign over us forever, that one day He will raise us to newness of life and not forevermore. The returning God, the God who has not gone away, never to come back again, but who is coming to receive us unto Himself. This is the God that we read about in the Bible. This is the God that's shown to us in the pages of Scripture. This is the God that's, that speaks to us from the world in which we live. This is our God. And when our world sees it, what do they do? They prop up their idols. They prop up their weak, pathetic ideas. And we did it ourselves, didn't we? But the gods of this world and the religions of this world and the answers of the other cannot stand before God as He is. They will always fall before Him. They will always bow before Him. Always. 
friends, all the evidence is there. I hope and pray as Christians that you're seeing it. Because that's what God does. He shows us it even more clearly. He reminds us of who He is and what He has done. And we are to be men and women who rejoice in what He shows us. Rejoice in what He teaches us. And, and to allow it to spill out of our lives so that we can be part of that, ma- that, that message to others. Because they need to hear men and women propping up their idols every day. Hoping that their weak and pathetic efforts to please God will be enough when they won't. Our religion, our, all our religions are powerless to please God, to stand before God. Only Christ can enable us to stand before God. But that's not the end of it. Because not only do we see it in their religion, but we see it in their sin, in the way that they behave, the way they react to the situation. Let me read the next uh, few verses to you. Verse 6 down to verse 12. And says, the hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon, our God. Poor Dagon. He was getting a rough time, wasn't he? So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of the God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so the tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Akron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Akron, the people of Akron cried out, They have brought around the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout a whole city and the hand of the God was heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors and the, city, uh, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So we see that the problems are not only existing within the temple. The problems exist outside the temple because the Philistines possess, have taken possession of the ark of God and this is not something that they're allowed. It's not something that God has given to them. So they're treating it with disdain by doing it disobediently and by putting it in the the temple of, uh, of Dagon. So, and God's judgment is against them and it's very clear, God is against the people of the Philistines because of their sin. And they are suffering terribly. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, adds a little bit to the verse. I'll maybe elucidate a wee bit more. It says, And the cities and the fields of, that, of all that region burst up, and mice were produced, and there was confusion of great death in the city. You see, the, you see what was happening? You've, you've got this, this awful, these awful tumors. And if you go through some of the comedies, there's some awful descriptions of what's going on here. Um, uh, Wilson, uh, or Wilkinson describes it as a bubonic plague with a, an extremely uh, high mortality rate, rate and the absolute panic that affected the, the population who were suffering from it. And it was spread by mice or rats. Now, we don't know if it's bubonic plague. That's just, a, that's just a, uh, somebody assuming that from the text. But what we want to express here is the awful situation that they're in. It's real. The panic and the death and the misery is real. And it all comes from their disobedience in that they have taken the ark of the Lord. But do you notice what they do? They know that it's the ark of the Lord. They mention it at least three times. This is the ark of the Lord, the ark of the Lord, the ark of the Lord. It's the ark of the God of Israel, the ark of the God of Israel. But what do they do? They look at what's happening to them and they say, well, how do we fix this problem here in Ashdod? Well, I think we'll send the ark to Akron. I imagine the Lord of Akron wasn't too fussed. I imagine he was outvoted in the discussion. Because if that's going to happen there, then it's going to happen in Akron. Nothing's changed. All that's changed is the location. And here we see the problem. 
Instead of actually dealing with their sin, instead of actually dealing with the source of their problem, all they do is move it around by disobeying God further and spreading misery. They sent it to all the cities of the Philistines so that everybody was miserable. The last poor city, they were crying out whenever they heard that it was coming, crying, don't let it come. Because they knew that death was coming. But it was such a prize to them. They wanted it because it was a sign of their victory. And let me tell you, it's in their city for, or it's in their cities for seven months. They're suffering this for seven months. They know what's causing it, and instead of doing something right, they just spread the problem around everybody else. Friends, is this not our world? Is this not us? Maybe even after we're saved. Where we know what's wrong, don't we? God makes it very clear what's wrong. He shows us our sin. He shows us who we are. But instead of actually dealing with our sin, instead of asking for forgiveness and putting our, and putting our, considering ourselves dead to sin and turning away from it, no, we nurture our sin. Think of the world that we live in. Think of this great big society which we live in. What do we know about it? It's full of sin, and it always has been. Thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and we have always been marked by greed and lust and fanaticism and violence and hunger for power and pride. Isn't it, haven't we? And here we are, and it's 2022, I'm nearly sure, and we have advanced greatly in human society. We are able to do amazing things, the technology and the health care that we have, it's wonderful and marvelous and great and just really wonderful. But friends, you go back into this book and go to its early pages, we're still suffering from the same problems that Adam and Eve suffer from. We're still suffering from the same problems that plagued the earliest society of humanity. The only thing is now, we can kill each other in greater numbers than we ever could before and in more miserable ways. The only difference now is that the strife that exists within our human is now seen as a good thing. You know, we live in a world where there's sown division between uh, men and women. There's sown division between different ethnicities. There's sown division between all different sections of community in our world. And they think that's going to help us be together more. They're help, they think that's going to help us be more, uh, be, be more peaceful. It's not. It's causing strife and difficulty and heartache between people who are brothers between people who are of one race. They're trying to make a 50 races. Friends, we live in a world where trust is at an all-time low. Who are our role models? Our role models in this society are people you would not let through the front door of your house because they're vile people and they love vile and wicked things. The people who our children listen to, the people who we listen to and watch are the most awful people you can imagine. And yet, we think that we're doing well. Friend, our society is sick. It's sick. And we are filled with sin. And all we try and do is when we notice a problem, we try to move it on to something else. We try to move it around. We try to shift it a little bit and, and wonder why it goes in the same problem. Usually because we want to keep the sin. I was thinking about that this this week. You know, we human beings, we have a problem with marriage, don't we? We have a problem with a man and woman being together for life. Being this one flesh entity before God to live and see life out together as one. We have a problem with that in our society. And so what do we do? We don't go back to the original, to what the design of marriage was. No, we try to alter it, don't we? We try to change it. No, we, 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 we introduce polygamy. We introduce dictatorship where one spouse rules over the other and tells them what to do. We, we, we go to the place where all we, where we don't like marriage. It's just a bit of paper. It doesn't really matter. Then we have open marriage where you can do whatever you want. And then you have same-sex marriage where it doesn't make any sense at all. And now we're back to polygamy. And a whole mixture of the same. Do you notice what we're doing? All we're doing is moving the goalpost. We're moving us, the good parts of marriage and introducing more opportunities for sin. 
More opportunities for wickedness. More opportunities for greed and vileness and awfulness. And it's not just mind. Every problem we face as humanity, that's what we do. We just move the problem around, keep the things that, that are going to do us harm, and reject the things that are going to do us good. We're just like the Philistines. We haven't changed one iota. We know our sin is dangerous. We know our sin is doing us awful, awful harm. But we're so afraid of losing sin, the sin that we love, that we will not actually do anything to help it. Friends, we want unity in humanity, but we're dividing ourselves. We want intimacy in humanity, but we think that's achieved by promiscuity. We want peace, but our entertainment is all about revenge and power and violence. We want to be good, but the people that we appreciate most are the most immoral, base, and shallow folk that we can imagine. And we haven't worked it out yet. We are on our 5,000th turn round around about. And we still haven't got it. That's the, the nature of human beings. It's the nature that exists within your heart and mine. We love sin so much, we don't want to do away from it. We don't want to reject it. We don't want to turn from it. Our sin is dangerous, and we still haven't worked it out yet. Folks, what are we, what are we trying to say today? Then it's time to wake up and trust the evidence. And I know that most people think Christians are the ones that ignore the evidence. They ignore, seemingly ignore the evidence that says that there is no God or that God does not care. But usually, usually that comes down to the fact that people think that God should be what they want him to be. He should do what they want him to do. And if he disagrees with them, if he does something opposite, then he's not there. Friends, I want to encourage you today to look at all the evidence that God gives you, even as a Christian, all the evidence that he sets before you to show you that he loves you, to show you that he is there for you, to show you that he, that, 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 there's, that he, he is the one who, who you can depend on when you can depend on no one else. Trust the evidence Trust what God has shown himself to be. And you see, that's the point. How do we know who God is? Well, when we know him, then we know who he is. When we look to him, then we know what he's like. Not at the church, because the church is flawed. Certainly not at the minister, because the minister is flawed. He can't even get around the roundabout. You know what I mean? He looked at Christ. He is the one. Trust the evidence that's in him. He is God himself. He is the one who's shown himself to us. He is the one who's died for us. He's the one who's lived for us. He's the one who's risen for us. He's the one who is alive at this moment for us. And he's the one who is coming for us. Friends, trust the evidence. Trust the evidence. And friends, it's when we, the people who bear the name of Christ, we're Christians after all, when we can trust the evidence, when we know we can trust the evidence, it's then we can share the evidence with others. It's then we can be useful to show people that they can trust the evidence too. And I pray with all my heart today that that's where we are, that we're trusting them, that we're not being fools, that we're not just being religious and thinking that's enough. They're not trying to be good and thinking that's going to be enough. Know that we're trusting in Jesus and knowing that he is enough. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just pray for your help this morning. Lord, we know that we get things wrong. We know we're just like everybody else. We, we make so many mistakes. We do so many foolish things and we're so slow to learn lessons. But Lord, we are yours and we ask that you will teach us the way that you would have us to go. Help us to be men and women who share this wonderful message with others. The good news that you are there and that you've shown yourself to us. Lord, we just pray that you will have mercy on our world, our loved ones, our friends who need to know you, who are far from you, and yet they need to be saved. Father God, work in ways that we cannot see. Move them in ways that we cannot understand, Lord. 
and show mercy to them, we ask. Amen. Amen.